In his Hespitfer of Tendler, Rabbi Ari Berman, president of Yeshiva University, said, Rabbi Tendler represented everything that Yeshiva University stands for. In the world of Torah Mada, Rabbi Tendler removed the Vav and fully integrated both aspects into his life. It was holistic. It was who he was. Rabbi Tendler removed the Vav. Torah Mada, complete synthesis. He would often quip in sheer uh, that there should be more Mada in the Torah classes, in the yeshiva part of Yeshiva University, and more Torah in the Mada classes at Yeshiva College. And he brought science into the Beit Midrash and Torah into the laboratory. Sophisticated sugyot were illuminated by scientific material, and his biology classes were peppered with Ma'amari Chazal. Indeed, Rav Kendler lived and breathed Yeshiva University's motto of Torah Mada. So much ink has been spilled, so many books and articles written and published, so many conferences trying to define, refine, and redefine Torah Umada. What is Torah Umada? And what was Torah Umada according to Rav Tendler? How did he interpret it? How did he apply it? In January of 2011, I had the privilege of organizing a shir here in Harnof for Marie Verapi Rav Tendler. And the title of the shir was Science in the Service of Halakha, Lessons in Emunat Chazal. In the lecture, Rav Tendler, Kedarko Bakodesh, with great finesse, attempted to reconcile Torah sources and passages in Chazal with science. And I think the title of that shir, that expression, science in the service of halakha, perfectly articulates Rav Tendler's approach to Torah Mada. According to Chazal, you all know, there is wisdom to be found among the Gentiles. Yesh, Chochmah Bagoyim, here in the Dapei Bekorot, on source number one. Chazal tell us, Im yomar lecha adam, if an individual tells you, Yesh, Chochmah Bagoyim, Tamin, if he tells you there is wisdom to be found among the Gentiles, believe him. Hadahu Dichtiv, as the verse in Sefer Ovadia says, Hashem says that on that day of reckoning, I will make the wise vanish from Edom and understanding from the mountain of Esav, which of course implies that there is wisdom among the Goyim. There is wisdom to be found in Edom and understanding to be found in Edom and in Esav. And this statement, Yesh, Chochmah Bagohim is not hyperbole, it's not theoretical. Or of Tendler, an appreciation and an understanding of this wisdom, science, medicine, technology, is indispensable for being able to interpret the Torah, for being able to perform the mitzvot ha-Torah, and to apply the halacha. Tendler would often cite the Talmud's critique here in source number two of one who knows how to calculate the calendar based on astronomy and the constellations, but does not do so. And continues that such calculations are considered a mitzvah. She mitzvah al hadam v'chashef tkufot umazalot. We are commanded, we are obligated to study these things, to be able to know how to make such calculations. He would point to the Gemara here in source number three, the first parak of Sanhedrin, which describes how Rav spent 18 months studying among the shepherds in order to understand the physiology of animals, of sheep, which blemishes on animals heal and which are permanent, to know which animals can be allowed on the Mizbeach. The Gemara there, just to give you a little context, is discussing the authority that Rav will have. It's the source for the concept of smicha. They give him the authority, more, more, yadin, yadin. He can answer on questions of iser, beheter. He can rule on monetary matters. But then there's a question, can he be matir bechorot? And so Rav says about himself, where I've underlined, but Rav, shmona asar chodashim gadalti etzel ro'e behima. Leida eze mum kavua ve eze mum over. I spent 18 months 
a year and a half studying biology, studying the anatomy of animals out in the fields in order to be able to paskin. Rav Temler would often cite the Gemara here in source number four, in Masechet Nida, where Rabbi Zeira was hesitant to rule on issues of Nida, of family purity, without the requisite knowledge of the physiology involved. And in fact, on more than one occasion, Rav Temler was very critical of Puskim, who lacked the requisite knowledge of female anatomy or the reproductive system and made mistakes either in Psak Halacha or in their printed Svari concerning the laws of family purity. For of Tendler, an understanding of the science is indispensable in order to pass in halacha. And this approach of his to Torah, Mada, science in the service of halacha, I think is best formulated in a comment of the Nitziv to Parashat Ba'alotcha, another source that Rav Tendler was fond of quoting. Here in source number five, the Torah in Parashat Ba'alotcha commands Aharon that when he kindles the lamps of the menorah, Ba'alotcha Tanei wrote, El mul pnei ha-menorah, ya'iru shiva Tanei wrote. The branches of the candelabrum of the menorah and the Beit HaMikdash, the Mishkan and later the Beit HaMikdash, have to face the center lamp. And then it's see here, in source number five, towards the bottom of the page, where I've underlined, writes, Mishum sheba Torah sheba peh, nichlal sheba chokhmot. The seven branches of the menorah represent seven different types of wisdom, seven different types of knowledge. Shebli yidiya b'chol ha-chokhmot, yef shar l'avol l'kama yikarei Torah. And without the knowledge and understanding of these types of wisdoms, it's impossible to be able to truly understand the fundamentals of Torah and to apply the halacha. The Nitziv here gives a number of examples. The Nitziv touches on this in a number of places in his comments on the Torah and his Hemek Davar. And then he writes, And all of these different chokhmot, all of these different branches of wisdom, all of these different fields, all of these different disciplines, they're there to explain ultimately and to illuminate, just as the menorah illuminates these branches of wisdom are there to illuminate the Torah, which of course is the center branch. Now it's interesting, the Nitziv here doesn't cite the Vilna Gon, but this idea is often attributed to the Vilna Gon. For many, Rabbi Eliyahu ben Shlomo Zalman of Vilna, Eliyahu Hasid, the Vilna Gon personifies the perfected Torah personality with his complete unflinching dedication to Torah study. Yet, the Gon also possessed a profound knowledge and deep understanding of secular studies, even encouraging his Talmidim to engage in the study of secular subjects. In their introduction to his Aderet Eliyahu, the Gon's own children attest to the fact that by the time he was 12 years old, he had mastered all the seven branches of secular wisdom, these seven branches that the Nitziv refers to. And according to written testimony, the Gon, as I mentioned, openly encouraged his students to pursue chokhmah, secular knowledge. One of his Talmidim, Rabbi Baruch Shik of Shlov, translated Euclid's elements into Hebrew. And if you take a look here, you'll turn the page and look at source number six. This is a passage, I apologize, it's very, very difficult, the text here. It was only printed once in The Hague, in Shnat Tafkuf Mem. But uh, if you look at the second line here towards the middle, again, the, the text is a little bit difficult to read. But here in the introduction to his translation of Euclid's The Elements from Greek into Hebrew, and, and uh, by the way, Euclid uh, is known as the father of geometry, and he, in this work, The Elements lays down the major principles of geometry. It was written about 300 BCE. Okay. In his introduction, uh, Rav Baruch Mishklov writes, Shamati bipi kadosh, I heard from his holy lips, 
כי כפי מה שיחסר לאדם ידיעות משערי החוכמות, לעומת זה יחסר לו מאה ידיעות בחוכמה התורה. To the degree that one is deficient in his understanding of all of these different types of secular wisdom, mathematics and science, so too he will be deficient in his understanding of the Torah 100-fold. And then uh, Rav Baruch of Shklov goes on to say that the Gona Vilna encouraged him to continue and translate these classics into Hebrew to make them accessible to the Jewish community. Now, should anyone question the veracity of this account here, it was published in The Hague, as I mentioned, in Tufkuf, excuse me, in Tufkuf Mem. Uh, yes, Tufkuf Mem, it's 1780, while the Vilna Gona was still alive. So, uh, very difficult uh, to question whether the Gon actually said this. It was printed during the Gon's own lifetime. And one of his closest disciples, Rabbi Yisrael of Shklov, writes in the introduction to his Pata Shulchan, which is a very important work on the mitzvot that apply here in Eretz Yisrael. He writes something very similar. He writes that the Vilna Gon explained that all secular wisdom is essential for our holy Torah and included in it. If you take a look here at the uh, middle, of, uh, of the first line, or towards the end of the first line, rather, Koamar, Koma Chochmot, Nitzrachim Latoratenu Hagdosha, Ukulimba. They're all included in the Torah. Vidiam, excuse me, Viadam Kulam Latachlita, and the Vilna Gon, he writes, he had a knowledge of all of them, he had mastered all of them. Including, he goes on to say, algebra and trigonometry and geometry and even music. And so I believe that Ruf Tendler merely saw himself as continuing this tradition. He understood the relationship of Torah and science the way the Rambam did down on to the Vilna Gon. It served him as a posek, as a more hora'a, day to day, and when tackling difficult Shiloh, controversial questions. As a posek, anyone who knew him knew that he could be unyielding, uncompromising, and unapologetic. He lived by the Torah's charge to the Dayan. Lo taguru mi ish. You shall not tremble before any man. And if you knew Rav Tendler, he did not tremble before anyone. Whether it was brain death, mitzitza bepeh, or ascending Har Habayit. He was unafraid to take a controversial stance, even at great personal cost. He strove for truth, often quoting the Maharshal's comment that any distortion of the Torah, any ziuf, is yahareg va'al yavor. One has to give up his life. Or of Salavajik's comparison of a posek who errs, who makes a mistake, to a Navi Sheker. But his stances on brain death and mitzitza bepeh they were based on his understanding of science and medicine. And he was critical of those poskim whom he believed were in error because they lacked the requisite scientific or medical knowledge. Science served him. He was impressed by the research, for instance, of Rav Gorin. Uh, Rav Gorin had conducted following the Six Day War with the Army Corps of Engineers, how he had the Army Corps of Engineers survey the topography of the Harabai to understand where it was permitted to go. And I, together with many of you sitting here, had the privilege of accompanying Rav Tendler many times up on Harabai. He was impressed by the overwhelming and compelling historical, archaeological, forensic, and chemical evidence identifying the Murex trunculus as the chilazon for the dying of Tchelet. His understanding of science also allowed him to explain difficult passages in the Torah and Chazal, how to reconcile Darwinism and evolution and the age of the universe with the story of creation and our tradition, for example, or how to understand why the Torah calls the Shafan and the Arnevit ruminants. He would share how, when he once visited Hawaii, they took him to a certain island where every few years, when certain conditions are met, the water completely recedes. For which uh, Rav Tendler could possibly provide a scientific explanation of Kriyat Yamsuf. Of course, it's all about the timing. 
right? And therein lies the miracle. Or how uh, before the Sinai was given back to Egypt, he together with a group of scientists was invited to study the flora and fauna in the Sinai. And uh, Rav Tendler, a post and a professor with a PhD in microbiology, identified lichens which live in the Sinai and in the Negev, which carve into the rock about one and a half to two millimeters deep. Not unlike how the Gemara in Sota, Rav Tendler suggested, relates how the Shamir engraved the Avne Choshen and the Avne Ephod. Science served Rav Tendler when explaining passages in Chazal which Lichora are inconsistent with modern science. Like the Mishnah in Hulim, which discusses the kashrut of an animal missing kidneys, which can't be. An animal without kidneys can't live. Or the mission in Hulin, which describes <laughs> the ritual status of an achbar shechetzio basar vechetzio adama, a rodent which is half rat, half dirt or mud. Can such a thing exist? Have we ever seen such a thing? And Rav Dendler was not uncomfortable in saying that Chazal based themselves on the science of their day, the science of their times, and through his vast scholarship, pointed to various scientific works, scientific texts, works of natural history of the Greeks from that very period, which describe such cases, animals without kidneys, rodents that are half mouse, half dirt, and explain that Chazal were de dealing in theoreticals. It doesn't have to mean that they saw these things, but they were dealing in the theoreticals. What if one would see such an animal? What would its status be with regards to Tumat Sheretz, where you touch the animal? That's the context there. Or the Gemara in Shabbat, and Dafkuv Zion, which says that it's permitted to kill lice because they do not reproduce. They come from sweat and dirt. Lice don't reproduce. And Rav Deller had no qualms explaining that Chazal believed in spontaneous generation, just like the entire world did at that time. And despite the fact that more modern post scheme like the Mishnah Brura rules that one is exempt even today if he would kill a louse because it does not reproduce, Rav Tendler ruled instead like the 18th century Italian rabbi and physician Rav Yitzchak Lompranti, author of the rabbinic encyclopedia Pachad Yitzchak, that no, today one indeed would be chayev for killing a louse with what we know after Van Lohenhoek, the father of microbiology, and after the advent of the microscope, that lice do indeed lay eggs and reproduce like every other insect. Anyone who has daughters here in Ghan <laughs> know very well that lice lay eggs and reproduce. It's not that Chazal, Chas Shalom were in error or made mistakes. They trusted scientists. They trusted in the scientific and medical community, the scientists and the doctors of their day. Yesh Chochma Bagoim Ta'amin. They believed there was wisdom found among the Gentile scientists and doctors. And so Rav Tendler also had no problem saying like the Gonim and like the Rambam and like many others before him, that we are not obligated to follow the medical advice or opinions of the Talmud. Our great Chachamim were basing themselves again on the medicine of the day. I mean, we all just saw how, over the course of the pandemic, the scientific and medical community made mistakes early on, trying to figure things out in real time. And certainly, in another 1,500 years from now, Many things that we believe to be true today may be proven wrong or maybe inconsistent with the current thought or trend or practice in medicine. Science served Rav Tendler. But the truth is, Rav Tendler's Torah Umada was not solely utilitarian. It wasn't merely just functional, that served a function or a purpose. It wasn't only in the service of halakha. Rav Tendler saw an inherent value in the study and appreciation of science to better understand Hashem's wondrous creation. And if you take a look here 
In source number eight, the Rambam in Hilchot Yisodei HaTorah, where he defines the mitzvah to love and to fear Hashem. The Rambam asks, What is the proper path? What is the way one can come to love and fear Hashem? After all, how can you truly love someone or something that you don't know, that you don't understand? And the Rambam continues, the Rambam explains that when an individual discerns and studies and appreciates Hashem's wondrous creation, His great creation, and he sees the great wisdom which is without end, that this creation, this world contains. Immediately, the Rambam writes, he will come to love Hashem. He will come to praise Hashem, to extol Hashem, and to desire Hashem with a great desire, a great love. Just like David HaMelech says, my soul thirsts for you, Hashem, the living God. How does one come to love Hashem? According to the Rambam, it's through plumbing the depths and studying and understanding his wondrous world, his wondrous Bria. And for Rav Tendler, the study of science and medicine wasn't, wasn't purely to know how to be able to paskin a shaila. That was a very important part of it. But it was so much deeper. It had an inherent value. It was about appreciating Hashem's wondrous creation. And he experienced that and felt that in the science laboratory, looking through a microscope at the smallest thing. He saw Hashem's hand in this world. He would often say, Mother Nature has a father. He saw Yad Hashem in the, the, the smallest cell under the lens of a microscope. And he also saw the Yad Hashem in his creation when he would go here to the biblical zoo here in Jerusalem with his family, when he would go to the new aquarium. I remember after the first time he visited the new aquarium here in Jerusalem, he came back with uh, his, his face all lit up, his eyes all lit up, with uh, almost, yeah, like almost the curiosity of a child so excited about witnessing Hashem's wondrous creation. In this week's Parsha, we'll read how Noah blesses his sons, Shem and Yafet, and says, Yafte lokim leyafet, leyafet, excuse me, Yafte lokim leyafet, vishkon be'ole Shem. And Hashem will give, will give great, great beauty, great beauty to Yafet, but it has to dwell in the tents of Shem. It's a famous comment of Rav Hirsch here in source number nine, that the beauty of Yafet the beauty and wisdom found in Western culture and Western civilization can indeed dwell together in harmony in the tents of shame. But if Tendler saw great beauty in the contributions of the West to our world, I'd like to end with a Mishnah that Rav Tendler was fond of quoting here in source number 10, very bottom of the page. And the Mishnah records, Rabbi Shimon Omer, Rabbi Shimon says, Hamalech baderech, someone who's walking along the way, vishoneh, and he's learning, he's reviewing his Mishnah, umafsik mi Mishnato, and he stops from his learning. And he closes the Sefer, puts down the book, the Omer, and he says to himself, ma na'e wow, how beautiful is that tree over there? Umana enirze. Wow, how gorgeous is that beautiful plowed field? When you walk here in Harnof, you say, wow, what a view. What a beautiful view. The Mishnah continues, The verse says about him, it's as if he is obligated in the death penalty, he's responsible, he's bringing about ki'ilu, not literally, but, but almost, almost. He's, he's responsible uh, for his own death, ki'ilu. He, he needs to be punished. He's done something wrong. 
The question that Rav Taylor asked is, what did he do wrong? He, he merely stopped for a moment to appreciate Hashem's creation, which as we just said, according to the Rambam, is one of the ways one can come to love Hashem. Rav Taylor explained in one word, he was mafsik. He stopped. He stopped learning. Meaning, he saw these as two different independent things. He saw that there's Torah, and then there's a beautiful tree or a beautiful field. He created conflict where there is no conflict. Rav Tendler saw no conflict between Torah and the natural world. For him, they lived together in perfect harmony. They complemented one another. Rav Tendler was equally at home quoting Galen as he was quoting the Rambam. Equally at home in the Dalit Amot of the Beit Midrash as he was in the four L's of the science lab. In the introduction to his classic work on the subject, Torah Umada, Rabbi Norman Lamb warns, quote, the intersections of Torah and Mada are not always clear. Indeed, they are more often than not elusive and indeterminate. For of Tendler, they were not elusive or indeterminate at all. As Rabbi Ari Berman, president of Shiva University, said in his Hespit, there was no vav in his version of Torah Umada. Just complete synthesis, no conflict, complete harmony. Rav Tedler's life was a Torah Chayim, a living, breathing Judaism that engages the modern world and confronts its challenges. The Gemara in Brachot teaches, Ali Pater Adam Mechavero, Ela Mitoch Dvar Halacha, Shemitoch Kach Zochreu. One should only take leave of his friend by sharing first with him a dvar halacha so that through it he will remember him. Why? What does the Gemara mean? Life is finite, temporary, fleeting. Even our relationships are fleeting. People come in and out of our lives. But Torah is eternal. The Torah is forever. The Torah is everlasting. When we study Torah together, that is eternal. That's an eternal bond that endures, that lasts forever. I felt that with Ruth Tenler, as I'm sure many of you did. The righteous, even in their death, are called living. Ruth Tenler's Torah continues to guide us. Like Moshe Rabbeinu, the Rambam Moshe ben Maimon, of Moshe Feinstein, Rav Tendler, Moreno Harav, Moshe David, Ben Yitzchak Isaac Zatzal, to our Torah, the generations, connecting them with our precious Masora. He was a living link in the chain of tradition and leaves a lasting legacy in the myriads he taught and inspired. Yehi Zichro Baruch.